Here we are, it's December 13th, the third Sunday of Advent, and as you can see, we are wearing the same clothes and happy to be doing so. As we have done the last couple weeks, we're going to have a person who's going to read our greeting and then the opening prayer, and then we're going to join in singing Angels We Have Heard on High. Well, good morning. This is our greeting and opening prayer. Praise be to God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has visited and redeemed the people. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, will you pray with me? God, you so love the world, as you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Grant to us the precious gift of faith that we may know that the Son of God has come and may have power to overcome the world and gain a blessed immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So let's sing, Angels We Have Heard on High. and tinsel, wreaths and ribbon. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it's tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes. 
the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season, not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Hey, watch Daddy light the candle. Daddy did a light. Light. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, today's scripture reading is going to be Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 11. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called the oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord, you will be named ministers of our God, you will feed on the wealth of nations, and in the riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are the people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness, as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes up, the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow. So the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. John 1, 6 through 8 says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer. For those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees, verse 25. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know. The one who is coming after me, I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. May God add God's blessing to this word. Now, Advent is the season of waiting and watching. 
The season of Advent parallels, you may know, the season of Lent. Advent begins the year for the Christian. So congratulations, we made it. This is the new year. And with this parallel time with Lent, the historic church always uh, thought Advent much like Lent. So the season was marked by repentance, introspection, and prayers for the coming of Jesus to be accompanied uh, by the disposition of the soul marked by obedience and meditation and worship. So just like Lent prepares for the light of Easter, Advent prepares for the light of Christmas. Now it's easy to miss this. We roll out the Christmas carols and we have uh, you know, all the hot chocolate and if you're like so many, we've been shopping for Christmas uh, this year since you know, pretty much March. So we end up losing sight of the preparation for the light that John the Baptist points out. We're in no position to see the light if we haven't been in a position of prayer and repentance. But there is good news. We have time remaining to us to prepare for the coming of Christ. Now the question remains, do we want to experience the power of the light? We need the light of Christ in the worst way. We've been overwhelmed by the darkness of a pandemic, by the shadows of partisanship, and by the gloom of isolation. The light of the world is coming afresh. And of all the times in my whole life, I palpably feel the need for its arrival. John the Baptist can feel the need for the light. He says, I am not the guy you're looking for, the one who is coming. I'm not worthy to undo his sandal. Move along, move along. So I've got to admit that I need the light and that I am completely insufficient on my own without it. In fact, without the light, I am lost, undone, and bereft of God's grace. With the light, though, I discover the greatest of all gifts in the, in the arrival of Jesus for me. I prepare for the arrival of the light. I want you to prepare, too. The church prepares the world for the arrival of the light. There was only one John the Baptist. And during the season of Advent, the church is called to prepare for the arrival of this light. We prepare for the light by calling attention to the darkness that surrounds us. I think it's ironic that the church is called to prepare for the light, given that most of the people in our world, they're convinced that they walk not in darkness, but in the light of their own shining. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you may remember the Roman soldiers. They come with lanterns and torches to find the light of the world. We can become convinced that we have enough light on our own, that apart from the presence and power and light of God's presence, we are sufficient. I mean, do you remember life before your cell phone, uh, you know, have your cell phone flashlight? Do you remember what that was like? I would fumble around behind a piece of furniture or blindly stick my hand in a toolbox to find my 10 millimeter socket, only to find that I, you know, I couldn't find what I was looking for. I needed that flashlight. Folks that dispute the relevance of God's presence or put trust in their own way of thinking or the collective theories of whatever it is, whatever scientific inquiry it might be, or the confidence of a philosophical model apart from the light of God's grace, can't even recognize that they're fumbling in the shadows. There are so many who are convinced that a political party or a civic disposition shows enough light to live by and enough light to transform our world by and then we discover to our disappointment that self-interest seems to invade every system. Without the light that dispels the darkness of our own meanness and self-interest, every single system becomes dark, no matter how much folks will demand otherwise. The way that John describes the role paraphrases Isaiah. His role is not the prophetic role. His job is, is not to pronounce judgment like a prophet or pronounce an oracle of future occurrence. He knows his job and it's his role to make the path straight. Have you ever tried to pilot a shopping cart through the aisle uh, at the store where you've got a, a rice spill? What you need, you see, is a broom. And the church must clear the way so that the world can see the light clearly. I mean, chronic 
uh, crankiness clouds our witness. Judgmentalism and meanness of heart in the church does nothing but take away from the light. R uh, running in the way that is opposite of the truth, of the way things actually are in the world, only blocks the light and points to all the finer points of that which is contrary to fact. Making straight the paths in front of the Lord is like clearing the windshield for the driver. Like the Baptist, in preparing for the coming of the light, I recognize that I am not that light. What a confession and what a repentance this must be for us and for the church. No matter how good we may be and no matter how polished I become, I am not the light. The church is not the light. We only point to the light. I read a piece by a prominent pastor from the Midwest, and he pointed out the fact that American Christianity has fancied itself as something on its own. Pastors become celebrities. Televangelists and prominent religious leaders regularly point to themselves and the monuments that they've created. But I can't do that. Jesus said that no one born could hold a candle to John the Baptist. How can I possibly think that anything I have, any sermon I preach, any ministry that I lead, any building that I build, is anything on its own? We are only witnesses. The church doesn't sit idly by, though, because we are witnesses. We have a job to do. If the world sees fit to fumble in the darkness, I've got to be ready with the light. The church has this job. I function as a witness to the coming of the light. The church is called to bear witness to testify to its coming. The church must declare that a light comes to shine that exposes our world as inadequate on its own. With the arrival of the light, everything's going to be brighter and clearer. The witness of the church must include the powerful claim that the light that's coming not only makes things clearer and brighter by showing the origin of that light in the heart and presence of God with us, we must make the claim that everything about the world in which we live also gets clearer and brighter too. The church makes the claim that the world itself, created and sustained by God's grace, but maligned by sin and brokenness, suddenly gets clearer when illuminated by the arrival and the saving work of Jesus. My individual life becomes clearer as the light of Christ shines. It doesn't get dimmer, but brighter. The light that dispels the darkness is once more on the move, but as witnesses to the light, We've got our work to do. We are called to clean the lens so that the world can see clearly. We are called to a season of repentance in the midst of Advent so as to present Jesus clearly. That's the function of repentance. Now, you may know that I've had to have a surgery to correct a cornea problem. Since late September, I've had blurry vision in my right eye and really beyond before that. And it's been so frustrating, it turns out the cornea acts like a squeegee system of the eye. It acts like the defroster in your car to clear the view. And my cornea, it was shot. And so hopefully by now, I'm healing up and even progressing uh, while you're watching. But I can't help but notice that the light doesn't shine properly when too many things get in the way. Nothing is clear. That's where repentance and prayer in the midst of Advent season can do that that job for our soul in our church and the church universal. So that's why when John the Baptist come, he comes, he comes with a repenting grace. And we pray for one another in our need and ourselves as we realize, as we look in the mirror, we have much to repent from. Can we repent from our indifference to the needs around us? Can we repent from our indifference to our own spiritual condition? and the way that we have journeyed further and further, not to the light, but from the light of God's presence. Can we possibly give an honest account of our souls and the soul of the church? As the communion liturgy states, we have not loved our neighbors, we have not been an obedient church, we have not done the will of the Lord. We nurture bitterness and hatred in our hearts and entertain falsehoods and contempt of those who don't share our opinion. 
This week we heard um, that threats of violence were made against just a regular poll worker. It's time for all the acrimony to end from the, from the Christian. It's time to bury the contempt and embrace the power of the cross. It's time to be holy and loving, filled with God's Spirit, filled with love and joy, peace and patience, gentleness and kindness. If we count ourselves among the body of Christ, we have no business using words of contempt, words of hatred, words of violence against anyone. That's what blocks the light. It's time to pray over that and release it all to the Lord so that the light of God's presence shines instead. Now we are in the season of repentance and prayer so that when the light of Christmas shines, it will shine clearly and all the brighter. We dare not mistake the Advent season for some bland month of false well-wishing and glib gift-giving. That's not what the church stands for. The church prepares for the arrival of the true light that lightens every person. So let us embark upon the difficult task of repentance and prayer in order to witness with great clarity, love, faith, and abiding hope to the light of Christ's presence. In our world, where every single other thing claims the status of the light, may the church be the witness to that which lies beyond itself, but without which we are absolutely lost. May we point to the light, that that light clears of self-interest, sin, and brokenness. May we prepare now in our homes and in our families so that we can be ready to point to the light. And can we do it together so that as the Lord wills, we will be in a position to do our small little part, to point to the light and allow the Lord's presence to shine in the lives of those around us. The good news of the Advent season is the same as the good news of Lent. Each Sunday, we remember that there is one who will be born in Bethlehem, one who will be called Emmanuel. God is with us. And so there's always a reason to be glad. There's always a reason to exalt the name of the Lord. His faithfulness knows no bounds. Hear this promise then from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Now this morning as we close our worship service, I want to invite you to pray for one another. Pray for a clarity of our purpose, of our vision. Pray for a cleansing from sin and brokenness. Ask God to do a work in your heart to remove hatred and indifference and contempt. Ask God to replace those with gentleness and kindness and, and God's overwhelming love. I think there is a, uh, an absolute uh, correlation between the prayer uh, of repentance and the arrival of God's overflowing love. And so I'd invite you to uh, join me in that prayer. May I ask you to pray for a parishioner, just their first name, and those from uh, Gibbsboro and Blackwood will know her, Sally. Pray for Sally, and also pray for another name, Dot, without belying too much of their own uh, identity there. I want to ask you to pray for them. Sally's dealing with some really difficult health issues. Pray for her husband as he also provides her care. And pray for a parishioner named Dot uh, who's dealing with grief. And for all of those who are feeling sick, for those who are unwell, friends of mine who've uh, con uh, contracted uh, the virus, let's pray for one another for healing. And after we have had this time of prayer, I will invite you to pray for your needs right where you are. 
and then we will pray the Lord's Prayer together. Good and gracious God, into these moments you call us. The world hasn't changed a whole lot from when John the Baptist first gave witness. And so you call us to that same powerful witness, not to ourselves, not to our abilities, but to you, the true light that lights our way. Polish us up. Cleanse us in this season. Help us to see what you see in us, for us, and through us. Lord, we would pray for one another in our need. I pray for those who are dealing with health issues. Lord, for the folks who are battling COVID-19, we pray for healing and help. I pray for the leaders of our nation all over that try to bring peace out of chaos. Lord, I pray for Sally, and I ask God for healing, for some paths forward for help. And I pray for Dot. I pray, God, that you would be with her comfort her, along with all of the others of us who grieve this day. In all things, Lord, we give you thanks. I pray that you would provide for the needs of our congregation members and those outside, for those who are watching, and for those, Lord, that we bear up in our prayers. And so now, Lord, even at the, in these moments, we allow space and time to lift up in prayer those who are on our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers. Thank you for teaching us to pray as you've taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, that, uh, that is the uh, conclusion, well, penultimate thing. There's a Christmas hymn coming after this message. Uh, you're welcome to sing along. God bless you. Thank you for, for uh, watching and for participating. Pray for our church. Why don't you share this message if you think somebody can benefit from it, or even if not, maybe you take some moments and share one with the other. God bless you.
glory. Ah. <laughs> That's very good. That's very good, Paul. It's good when we know the songs. Yeah, right? And then we don't. And then we'd heaven help us. 